Derry, the third interlude. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. He bit an ingle worm in helps, and I the fellow, Ro. Emily Dickinson. A bird came down the walk. March 17th, 1985. The fire at the black spots happened in the late fall of 1930. So far as I am able to determine, that fire, the one my father barely escaped, ended the cycle of murder and disappearance which happened in the years 1929-30. to 30. Yes, this explosion at the ironworks ended a cycle of some 25 years before. It is as if a monstrous sacrifice is needed at the end of the cycle to quiet whatever terrible force it is which works here, to send it to sleep for another quarter century or so. But... If such a sacrifice is needed to end its cycle, it seems that some similar event is needed to set its cycle in motion. Which brings me to the Bradley Gang. Their execution took place at the three-way intersection of Connell, Maine, and Kansas. Not far, in fact, from the place shown in the picture which began to move for Bill and Richie one day in June of 1958. Some 13 months before the fire at the Black Spot, in October of 1929, not long before the stock market crash. As with the fire of the black spot, many Derry residents affect not to remember what happened that day. Or they were out of town, visiting relatives. Or they were napping that afternoon and never found out what had happened until they heard it on the radio news that night. Or they will simply look you full in the face and lie to you. The police locks for that day indicate that Jeff Sullivan was not even in town. Sir, I remember. Aloysius Nell told me, from a chair on the St. Terrace of the Paulson Nursing Home in Bangor. That was my first year in the force, and I ought to remember. He was off in western Maine, bird hunting. They'd been set out and carried off by the time he got back. Mother than a wet when was Jim Sullivan. But a picture in a reference book on gangsters called Blood Letters and Batman shows a grinning man standing beside the bullet riddle corpse of Al Bradley in the morgue. And if that man is not Jeff Sullivan, it is surely his twin brother. It was from Mr. Ken that I finally got what I believe to be the true version of the story. Norbert Ken, who was the proprietor of the Center Street drugstore from 1925 until 1975. He talked to me willingly enough, but like Betty Ripson's father, he made me turn off my tape recorder before he would really unwind the tale. Not that it mattered, I can hear his paper boy yet. Another a cappella singer in the damned chore that is this town. No reason not to tell you, he said. No one will print it and no one would believe it even if they did. He offered me an old fashioned apothecary jar. Licorice whip? As I remember, you were always partial to rare ones, Mikey. I took one. Was Jeff Sullivan there today? Mr. King left and took a licorice whip for himself. You wondered about that, did you? I wondered, I agreed, showing a piece of the red licorice. I hadn't had one since I was a cat, solving my penis across the counter to a much younger and sprayer Mr. Kane. It tasted just as fine as it had back then. You're too young to remember when Bobby Thompson hit his home run for the Giants in the playoff game in 1951, Mr. Kane said. You wouldn't have been but four years old. Well, they were an article about that game in a newspaper a few years after, and it seemed like just about a million folks from New York claimed they were there in the ballpark that day. Mr. King gummed his licorice whip, and a little dark drool ran down from the corner of his mouth. He wiped it off fastidiously with his handkerchief. We were sitting in the office, behind the drugstore, because although Norbert King was 85 and retired 10 years, he still did the box for his grandson. Just the opposite when it comes to the Broadley gang, Ken explained. He was smiling, but it was not a pleasant smile. It was cynical, coldly reminiscent. There was maybe 20,000 people who lived in downtown Dury back then. Main Street and Connell Street had both been paved for 30 years, but Kansas Street was still dirt. Raised dust in the summer and turned into a bug hole every March and November. They used to oil up Mile Hill... Every June and every 4th of July, the mayor would talk about how they were going to pave Kansas Street. But it never happened until 1942. It... But what was I saying? 
20,000 people who live right downtown. I prompted. Uh, well, of those 20,000, there's probably half that have passed away since. Maybe even more. 50 years is a long time. And people have a funny way of dying young in theory. Perhaps it is the year. But of those left, I don't think you'd find more than a dozen who'd say they were in town the day the Bradley gang went to Toffet. But Roden over at the meat market would fess up to it, I guess. He keeps a picture of one of the cars they had up on the wall where he cuts meat. Looking at that picture, you'd hardly know it was a car. Charlotte Littlefield would tell you a thing or two, if you could get on her good side. She teaches over to the high school, and although I reckon she must not have been more than 10 or 12 at the time, I bet she remembers plenty. Carl Snow, Aubrey Stacy, Evan Stamnell, and that old user who paints those funny pictures and drinks all night at Wallis. Pickman, I think his name is. They'd remember. They were all there. He trailed off vaguely, looking at the liquors waving his hand. I thought of prodding him and decided not to. At least, he said, most of the others would lie about it. The way people lied and said they were there when Bobby Thompson hit his homer. <laughs> That's all I mean. But people lied about being at that ball game because they wished they had been there. People would lie to you about being in Derry that day because they wished they hadn't been. Do you understand me, Sonny? I know that. You sure you want to hear the rest of this? Mr. Keen asked me. You're looking a bit piqued, Mr. Mikey. I don't, I said. But I think I better, all the same. Okay, Mr. Keen said mildly. It was my day for memories, as he offered me the apothecary jar with the liquor's ribs in it. I suddenly remembered the radio program my mother and dad used to listen to when I was just late of it. Mr. Keen... Treasure of Lost Person. Sure, he was there that day. All right. He was supposed to go bird hunting, but he changed his mind damn quick when Lal Macon came in and told him that he was expecting Cold Bradley that very afternoon. How did Macon know that? I asked. Well, that's an instructive tale in itself, Mr. Keon said, and the cynical smile creased his face again. Bradley wasn't ever public enemy number one on the FBI's hit parade, but they had wanted him since 1928 or so, to so they could cut the mustard, I guess. Old Bradley and his brother George hit six or seven banks across the Midwest and then kidnapped a banker for ransom. The ransom was paid, $30,000, a big sum for those days, but they killed the banker anyway. By then... The Midwest had gotten a little toasty for the gangs that ran there. So Al and George and their litter of rattlings ran northeast, up this way. They rented themselves a big farmhouse just over the town line in Newport, not far from where the rolling farms are today. That was in the dog days of 29. Maybe July, maybe August, maybe even early September. I don't know for sure just when. There were eight of them. Al Bradley, George Bradley, Joe Conklin, and his brother, Carl. An Irishman named Arthur Malloy who was called Creeping Jesus Malloy because he was nearsighted, but wouldn't put on his specs unless he absolutely had to. In Patrick Cody, a young fellow from Chicago who was said to be killed crazy but as handsome as Adonis. There were also two women with them, Kitty Donahue, George Bradley's common law wife, and Mary Hosher, who belonged to Cody but sometimes got passed around, according to the stories we all heard later. They made one bad assumption when they got up here, Sonny. They got the idea they were so far away from Indiana that they were safe. They laid low for a while and then got bored and decided they wanted to go hunting. They had plenty of power but they were a bit low on ammunition. So they all came into Tour on the 7th of October in two cars. Patrick Cody took the woman around shopping while the other men went into making sporting goods. Kitty Donahue bought a dress in freezers, and she died in it two days later. Lon Macon waited on the man himself. He died in 1959. Too fat, he was. Always too fat. 
But there was nothing wrong with his eyes, and he knew it was old Bradley the minute he walked in, he said. He thought he recognized some of the others, but he wasn't sure of Malloy until he put on his specs to look at a display of knives in a glass case. Old Bradley walked up to him and said, We'd like to buy some ammunition. Well, Lord Meekin says, You came to the right place. Bradley handed him a paper and Lal read it over. The paper has been lost, uh, at least so far as I know, but Lal said it would have torn your blood cold. They wanted 500 rounds of 38 caliber ammunition, 800 rounds of 45 caliber, 60 rounds of 50 caliber, which they don't even make anymore, shotgun shells loaded both with buck and bird, and a thousand rounds each of 22 short, and long rifle. Plus, Get this, 16,000 rounds of 45 machine gun bullets. Holy shit, I said. Mr. King smiled that cynical smile again and offered me the apothecary jar. At first, I shook my head and then I took another whip. This here is quite a shopping list, boys, Lol says. Come on, now. Gripping Jesus Malloy says. I told you he wasn't going to get it in a heat down like this. Not going up to Bangor. They won't have nothing there either. But I can use a right. No, hold your courses. Lol says, just as cool as a cucumber. This here is one call of a good order, and I wouldn't want to lose it like you, up Bangor. I can give you the 22s right now. Also the bird and half the buck. I can give you 100 rounds each of the 38 and 45 caliber too. I could have the rest for you, and here Lol sort of had close his eyes and tapped his chin, as if calculating it out, by the day after tomorrow, how would that be? Bradley grinned like he'd split his head around the back and said it sounded just as fine as paint. Cole Conklin said he'd still like to go up on, up uh, to Bangor, but he was outvoted. No, if you're not sure you can make it on this order, you ought to say so right now. Well, Bradley says to Lal, Because I'm pretty fine fellow, but when I get mad you don't want to get into fishing contest with me, you fall? I do, Lal says, and I'll have all the ammo you could want, Mr... Raider, Brady says, Richard D. Raider, at your service. He stuck out his hand, and Lal pumped it, grinning all the while. Real pleased, Mr. Raider. So then Bradley asked him what would be a good time for him and his friends to drop by and pick up the goods, and Lol making asked them right back how to in the afternoon sounded to them. They agreed that would be fine. Out they went. Lal watched them go. They met the two women and Cody on the sidewalk outside. Lal recognized Cody too. So, Mr. Keen said, looking at me bright-eyed. What do you think Lal done then? Call the cops? I guess he didn't, I said, based on what happened. Me, I would have broken my leg getting to the telephone. Well, maybe you would, and maybe you wouldn't, Mr. Kane said with that same cynical, bright-eyed smile, and I shivered because I knew what he meant, and he knew I knew. When something heavy begins to roll, it can be stopped. It's simply going to roll until it finds a flat place long enough to wear away all of its forward motion. You can stand in front of that thing and get flattened, but that won't stop it either. Maybe you would have, and maybe you wouldn't, Mr. Kane repeated. But I can tell you what Lal Macon did. The rest of the day and all of the next, when someone he knew came in, some man, why, he would tell them that he knew who had been out in the woods around the Newport Dory line shooting at deer and girls and God knows what else with Kansas City typewriters. It was the Bradley gang. He knew for a fact because he had recognized him. He told them that Bradley and his men were coming back the next day around two to pick up the rest of their order. He told them he'd promise Bradley all the ammunition he could want, and that was a promise he intended to keep. How many? I asked. I felt hypnotized by his glittering eye. Suddenly, the dry smell of this back room, the smell of prescription drugs and powders, of monster oil and big spapoo wrap and rubitus and cough syrup, suddenly all those smells seemed suffocating. But I could no more have left than I could kill myself by holding my breath. How many men did Lal pass the word to? Mr. Keane asked. 
I know that. Don't know for sure, Mr. Keen said. Didn't stand right there and take up sent right duty. All those he felt he could trust, I suppose. Those he could trust, I mused. My voice was a little hoarse. Oh, yeah, Mr. Keen said. Nurry man, you know, not that many of them raise cows. He laughed at this old joke before going on. I came in around ten the day after the Bradleys first dropped in on Lull. He told me the story, then asked how he could help me. I'd only come in to see if my last roll of pictures had been developed. In those days, Macon handled all the Kodak films and cameras. But after I got my photos, I also said I could use some ammo for my Winchester. You gonna shoot some game, Norv? Lull asked me, passing over the cells. Might pluck some warm inch. I said, and we had us a chuckle over that. Mr. Keane laughed and slapped his skinny leg as if this was still the best joke he had ever heard. He leaned forward and tapped my knee. All I mean, son, is that the story got around all it needed to. A small towns, you know. If you tell the right people, what you need to pass along will get along. See what I mean? Like another licorice whip? I took one with numb fingers. Make you fat. Mr. Keen said, and cuckled. He looked old and infinitely old, with his bifocal slipping down the gaunt blade of his nose, and the skin stretched too tight and thin across his cheeks to wrinkle. The next day I brought my rifle into the store with me and Bob Turner, who worked harder than any assistant I ever had after him, brought in his pop shotgun. Around eleven that day, Gregory Cole came in for a big curve of soda and dumped if he didn't have a cold forty-five gun right in his belt. Don't blow your balls off with that, Greg, I said. I came out of the woods all the way from Milford for years and I got one fuck of a hangover, Greg says. I guess I'll blow someone's balls off before the sun goes down. Around one thirty, I put the little sign I had. Be back soon, please be patient, in the door, and took my rifle and walked out the back into Rachel's alley. I asked Bob Turner if he wanted to come along, and he said he'd better finish filling Mrs. Emerson's prescription and get simulator. Leave me a live one, Mr. Keen, he said. But I allowed, as how I couldn't promise nothing. There was hardly any traffic on Canal Street at all, neither on foot or car. Every now and then, a delivery truck would pass, but that was about all. I saw Jake Finette cross over and he had a rifle in each hand. He met Andy Grace and I walked over to one of the benches that used to stand where the war memorial was. You know, where the colonel goes underground. Pretty funnies and Al Nell and Jimmy Gordon were all sitting on the guard coast steps, eating sandwiches and fruit out of their dinner buckets trading with each other for stuff that looked better to them, the way kids do on the schoolyard. They was all armed. Jimmy Gordon had himself a world gold first Springfield that looked bigger than he did. I see a kid go walking toward up my hill. I think maybe it was Zach Denbrough, the father of your old body, the one who turned out to be a writer. And Kenny Vorton says from the window of the Christian Science Reading Room, you want to get out of here, kid. There's going to be shooting. Zack took one look at his face and ran like hell. There were men everywhere. Men with guns, standing in doorways and sitting on steps and looking out of windows. Greg Cole was sitting in a doorway down the street with his forty-five in his lap and about two dozen shells lined up beside him like toy soldiers. Bruce, Jaeger, Major, and that sweat all of the Ramenius, were standing underneath the marquee of the video in the south. Mr. Keane looked at me. Through me, his eyes were not sharp now. They were hazy with memory, soft as the eyes of a man only become when he's remembering one of the best times of his life. The first home run he ever hit, maybe. Or the first trot he ever landed that was big enough to keep. Or the first time he ever lay with a willing woman. I remember I heard the wind, Sandy, he said dreamily. I remember hearing the wind, hearing the Kurt Cows clock toll too. Bob Turner came up behind me and I was so tight wired I almost blew his head off. He only nodded at me and crossed over to Bannock's dry cuts, trailing his shadow out behind him. 
The Wutkif thought that when it got to be two turn and nothing happened, then to fifteen, then to twenty, folks would have just up and left, wouldn't you? But it didn't happen that way at all. People just kept their place, because... Because you know they were going to come, didn't you? I asked. There was never any question at all. He filmed at me like a teacher plays with a student's recital. That's right, he said. We knew. No one had to talk about it. No one had to say, Oh, let's wait until the 20 past, and if they don't show, I've got to get back to work. Things just stayed quiet. And around 2.25 that afternoon, these two cars, one red and one dark blue, started down up Mile Hill and came into the intersection. One of them was a Chevrolet and the other was a LaSalle. The Conklin brothers, Patrick Cody and Murray Horser were in the Chevrolet. The Bradleys, Malloy and Kitty Donahue were in the LaSalle. They started to the intersection, okay? And then Al Bradley slammed on the brakes of that LaSalle so sudden that Cody them near ran into him. The street was too quiet and Bradley knew it. He was nothing but an animal, but it doesn't take much to put up an animal's wind when it's being chased like a whistle in a corner for four years. He opened the door of the LaSalle and stood up on the running board for a moment. He looked around, then he made a go back gesture to Cody with his hand. Cody said, What was? I heard that plain as day. The only thing I heard any of them say that day. There was a wink of sun, too. I remember that. It came off a compact mirror. The horse woman was powdering her nose. That was when Lal Macon and his helper Beef Marlowe came running out of Macon's store. Put them up, Bradley, you're surrounded. Lal shot, and before Bradley could do more than turn his head, Lars started blasting. He was wild at first, but then he put one into Bradley's shoulder. The chloride started to pour out of the coal right away. Bradley caught hold of the LaSalle's doorpost and sunk himself back into the car. He threw it into gear, and that's when everyone started to shoot. It was all over in four, maybe five minutes, but it seemed a walk hell of a lot longer while it was happening. Petty and Al and Jimmy Gordon just sat there on the courthouse steps and poured bullets into the back end of the Chevrolet. I saw Bob Turner down on one knee, firing and working the bolt on that old rifle of his, like, a madman. Joker Major and Thraminius were shooting at the right side of the LaSalle from under the theater Mercury, and Greg Cole stood in the gutter, holding that forty-five automatic out in both hands, pulling the trigger just as fast as he could work it. There must have been fifty, sixty men firing all at once. After it was all over, Lalmik and dug thirty-six locks out of the brick side of his store, and that was three days later. After just about every done body in town who wanted one for a seminary, he had come down and dug one out with his pink knife. When it was at its worst, it sounded like the bottle of the morn. Windows were blown in by rifle fire all around Macon's. Bradley got the LaSalle around in a half circle, and he wasn't slow, but by the time he'd done, he was running on four flats. Both the headlights were blowed out, and the windscreen was gone. Creeping Jesus Malloy and George Bradley were each at a backseat window, firing pistols. I seen one bullet take Malloy hang up in the neck and tear it wide open. He shot twice more and then collapsed out the window with his arms hanging down. Cody tried to turn the chevrolet and only ran into the back end of Bradley's LaSalle. That was really the end of him right there, son. The chevrolet's front bumper locked with the LaSalle's back one, and there weren't any chance they might have had to make a run for it. Joe Conklin got out of the back seat and just stood there in the middle of the intersection, a pistol in each hand, and started to pour it on. He was shooting at Jake Pinot and Andy Chris. The two of them fell off the bench they'd been sitting on and landed in the grass. Andy Chris shouting, I'm killed, I'm killed, over and over again. Although he was never so much as touched, neither of them were. Joe Conklin, he had time to fire both his guns empty before anything so much as touched him. His coat flew back and his pants twitched like some woman you couldn't see was stitching on them. He was wearing a straw hat and it flew off his head so you could see how he'd sunter parted his hair. 
He got one of his guns under his arm and was trying to reload the other when someone cut the legs out from under him and he went down. Kenny Burton claimed him later, but there was really no way to tell. Could have been anybody. Conklin's brother Carl came out after him, soon Joe fell, and down he went like a ton of bricks with a hole in his head. Mary Horser came out, maybe she was trying to surrender, I don't know. She still had the compact, she'd been using the powder her nose in her right hand. She was screaming, I believe, but by then it was hard to hear. Bullets were flying all around them, that compact mirror was blown right out of her hand. She started back to the car then, but she took one in the hip. She made it somehow, and managed to crawl inside again. Old Bradley revved the lasal up just as high as it would go and managed to get it moving again. He dragged the chevrolet at maybe ten feet before the bumper tore right off in it. The boys poured lead into it. All the windows were busted. One of the mud guards was laying in the street. Malloy was dead hanging out the window, but both of the Bradley brothers were still alive. George was firing from the back set. His woman was dead beside him with one of her eyes shot out. Old Bradley got to the big intersection, then he saw the mounted the car and stopped there. He got out from behind the wheel and started running up Connell Street. He was riddled. Padre Cody got out of the Chevrolet, looked as if he was going to surrender for a minute, then he grabbed up 38 through a cheater holster under his armpit. He triggered it off maybe three times, just firing wild, and then his shirt blew back from his chest in flames. He was let down the side of the Chevy until he was sitting on the running board. He shot one more time, and so far as I know, that was the only bullet that hit anyone. It ricocheted off something and then grazed across the back of Greg Cole's hand. Left a score he just to show off when he was drunk until someone, or nil, maybe, took him aside and told him it might be a good idea to shut up about what happened to the Bradley gang. The Husser woman came out and that time wasn't any doubt she was trying to surrender. She got her guns up. Maybe no one really meant to kill her, but by then there was a crossfire and she walked right into it. George Bradley ran as far as that bench by the war memorial. Then someone popped it the back of his head with a shotgun blast. He fell down that with his bench full of pills. Hardly where I was doing it, I took a licorice wave from the jar. They went to pouring around into those cars for another minute or so before it began to top her off, Mr. Keane said. When men get their blood up, it doesn't go down easy. That was when I looked around and saw Sheriff Sheldon behind Nell and the others on the court court steps, putting runs through the dead survey with a Remington pump. Don't let anyone tell you he wasn't there. Norbert Keane is sitting in front of you and telling you he was. By the time the firing stopped, those cars didn't look like cars at all anymore. Just hunks of junk with glass around them. Men started to walk over to them. No one talked. All you could hear was the wind and feet gritting over broken glass. That's when the picture taking started. And you ought to know this, Sonny. When the picture taking starts, the story's over. Mr. King rocked in his chair, his slippers bumping placidly on the floor, looking at me. There's nothing like that in the drawings, was all I could think of to say. The headline for that day had read, State Police, FBI gunned down Bradley Gang in Pitted Battle, with the subhead, Local Police Land Support. Course not, Mr. King said, laughing delightedly. I seen the publisher, McLaughlin, put the ranch into Joe Conklin himself. Christ, I muttered. Get enough licorice, Sonny? I got enough, I said. I licked my lips. Mr. King, how could I think of that? That magnitude, the covered up. Was it no cover up? He said, looking honestly surprised. It was just that no one talked about it much, and really, who cared? It was President and Mrs. Hoover that went down that day. It was no worse than shooting mad dogs that would kill you with a bite if you give them half a chance. But the woman? Couple of wars, he said indifferently. Besides, it happened in Dury, not in New York or Chicago. The police makes it news as much as what happened in the place, honey. That's why there are bigger headlines when an earthquake kills 12 people in Los Angeles than there are when one kills 3,000 in some heathen country in the Mideast. Besides, it happened in Dory. I've heard it before. And I suppose if I continue to pursue this, I'll hear it again. And again, and again. They say it as if speaking patiently to mean to effective. They say it the way they would say, because of gravity, if you ask them how come you stick to the ground when you walk. 
No it's such as if it were natural law any natural man should understand. And of course, the worst of that is I do understand. I got one more question for Norbergen. Did you see anyone at all that day that you didn't recognize once the shooting started? Mr. Keane's answer was quick enough to drop my blood temperature 10 degrees, or so it felt. The clown? You mean? How did you find out about Kim, Sonny? Oh, I heard it somewhere, I said. I only caught a glimpse of him. Once things got caught, I tuned it pretty much to my own knitting. I glanced around just once and saw him up street beyond the shoots under the village's marquee, Mr. Keane said. He wasn't wearing a clown suit or nothing like that. He was dressed in a pair of farmer's bivouls and a cotton shirt underneath. But his face was covered with that white grease paint they use, and he had a big red clown smile painted on. Also had these tufts of fake hair, you know? Orange. Sort of comical. Well, Nick, you never saw that fellow, but Beef did. Only Beef must have been confused because he thought he saw him in one of the windows of an apartment over somewhere to the left. And once, when I asked Jimmy Gordon... He was killed in Pearl Harbor, you know, went down with his ship to California. I think it was. He said he saw the guy behind the war memorial. Mr. Kane shook his head, smiling a little. It's funny how people get to drink a thing like that, and even funnier what they remember after it's all over. You can listen to 16 different tales and no two of them will jive together. Take the gun that clown fellow had, for instance. Gun? I asked. You were so dang too? Oh, yeah, Mr. Kane said. The one glimpse I caught of him, it looked like he had a Winchester bolt action, and it wasn't until later that I figured out I must have thought that because that's what I had. Biff Barlow thought he had a Remington, because that was what he had, and when I asked Jimmy about it, he said that guy was shooting an old Springfield, just like his. Funny, huh? Funny, I managed. Mr. Kane... Didn't any of you wonder what in hell a clown, especially one in Farmer's Bivols, was doing there just then? Sir, Mr. Kane said. It was no big deal, you understand? But sure, we wondered. Most of us figured it was somebody who wanted to attend the party but didn't want to be recognized. A town council member, maybe. Horace Mueller, maybe. Or even Trace Nuffler, who was mayor back then. Or it could just have been a professional man who didn't want to be recognized. A doctor or a lawyer, I wouldn't have recognized my own father in a getup like that. He laughed a little and I asked him what was funny. There's also a possibility that it was a real clown, he said. Back in the 20s and 30s, the county fair in SD came a lot earlier than it does now, and it was set up and going full blast that week that the Bradley gang made the rent. There were clowns at the county fair. Maybe one of them heard we were going to have our own little corner ball and rolled down because he wanted to be in on it. He smiled at me, dryly. I'm about talked out, he said. But I'll tell you one more thing, since you appear to be so interested and you listen so close. It was something Beef Marlowe said about 16 years later, when we were having a few beers up to pill watching finger. Right after a clear blue sky, he said it said that Clown was leaning out of the window so far that Beef couldn't believe he wasn't falling out. It wasn't just his head and shoulders and arms that was out. Beef said he was right out to the knees, hanging there in mid-air, shooting down at the cars the broadleaf cat came in, with that big red grin on his face. He was tricked out like a jackal artwin that had caught a bad sugar. Watch how Beef put it. Like he was floating, I said. Well... Mr. Kane agreed. And Beef said there was something else. Something that bothered him for weeks afterward. One of those things you get right on the tip of your tongue but won't quite come off. Or something that lights on your skin like a mosquito or a nauseum. He said he finally figured out what it was one night when he had to get up and tap a kidney. He stood there rushing into the bowl, thinking of nothing in particular. When it came to him all at once that it was 2.25 in the afternoon, when the shooting started and the sun was out, but that clown didn't cast any shadow. No shadow at all.